So from the previous lecture, we know that the amniote most recent common ancestor had two lineages, one of which was the synapsids. And synapsids are mostly known because they gave rise to the therapsida, and uh, therapsids eventually gave rise to the mammals. Now the other lineage, the diapsida, includes many kinds of organisms, reptilomorphs, one of which are the archosauria. Uh, archosaurs have several groups, one of which are the dinosaurs, and our modern representatives of the dinosaurs are the birds, or aves. Now when we think about endothermy, modern endotherms would include two groups, obvious groups, one of which are the mammals and one of which are the birds. And so looking at this part of the vertebrate tree of life, you would have to say that uh, endothermy, the phenomenon of endothermy, would have to have probably evolved twice. One of which would have been along the lineage somewhere giving rise to mammals, and the other one somewhere along the lineage giving rise to birds. The other alternative which at least theoretically might apply would be that the amniote most recent common ancestor was an endotherm and the characteristic of endothermy was inherited unchanged both in mammals and in birds but that seems highly unlikely given the fact that most of our other modern diapsids like crocodiles and lizards and snakes and turtles they're all non-endothermic or ectothermic and there's also the argument that endothermy as compared with ectothermy sort of screams out at you. This is a derived characteristic and ectothermy is ancestral because you know, endothermy, in order to, to be endothermic, it requires physiological traits that are more complex and more involved. There are more bells and whistles associated with the uh, physiology of endothermy as compared with ectothermy. And given the fact that we're talking about an ancient, uh, relatively primitive amniote most recent common ancestor it would make sense that this would have had the simpler characteristic which, which is also shared by the outgroup which in this case would have been amphibians. Okay so before we get any further let's actually define what we mean by endothermy. There's some potential for confusion here for example uh, when we say endothermic does that mean the same as warm-blooded? Because after all, birds are warm-blooded, mammals are warm-blooded, we say both are endothermic. And I guess you can say, yeah, well, yeah, the, and these endotherms do maintain uh, an elevated uh, body temperature. And a non-warm-blooded animal, like a lizard, could have its body temperature, its blood temperature, drop substantially below that of your typical hummingbird. The difference, though, is that lizards often actually have pretty warm blood, even though they're technically ectothermic. Uh, Having warm blood is uh, actually a pretty good thing. It allows you to maintain a higher metabolic rate. And if you were to take the temperature, if you were to monitor the temperature of a crocodile over the course of the day, you would probably find that its body temperature was really not all that much cooler, especially during the, during the daytime when it's warm. It's not all that much cooler compared to a warm-blooded monkey or jaguar that might be sharing the same habitat. Now there's another similar uh, related, but not the same term that gets thrown around here, and that's homeothermic. Is endothermy the same as homeothermy? Now homeothermy basically means a homeostasis of body temperature. A homeostatic mechanism is one where you maintain a constant set point. And so an animal that's homeostatic is going to have a relatively constant body temperature. And that's a little bit different from endothermy, which basically refers to the fact that the body temperature is generated from inside. Right. Endothermic animals generate body temperature inside. Ectothermic animals get their elevated body temperature from the outside. But an ectothermic animal can also be homeothermic if it maintains its body temperature behaviorally. Uh, for example, a lizard that comes out into the sun basks, elevates its body temperature so that its body temperature is actually running pretty close to 37 or 40 degrees, is um, is behaviorally homeothermic. And so these terms are actually technically kind of different. And so the question that nobody's asked yet is, is why is it a good thing to have elevated body temperature at all? I mean, what, what's wrong with keeping your body temperature nice, icy, and cold all the time? It has a lot to deal with enzymes. And so at the top of this PowerPoint slide, I've got the uh, relationship between enzyme activity and temperature. This is something that probably a lot of you have seen if you've taken another biology class like Bio 110, which is a standard exercise where we monitor the activity of an enzyme over a range of temperatures. And what we typically find is that we find increasing enzyme activity as temperature increases. And it's kind of a J-shaped curve. This, this increase in enzyme activity with temperature has everything to do with kinetics. 
the higher the temperature, the more encounters between catalysts and substrate you get. And the relationship uh, between the rate of encounter, the rate of enzyme activity, and temperature is going to be nonlinear and kind of J-shaped. Now, uh, above the optimal temperature, if you look at the right-hand side of the graph, there's potentially a very rapid decline. And this has to deal with the uh, lability of most proteins to elevate a temperature. Proteins are held together by relatively weak forces. And if we go above a certain temperature, that at that point, the kinetic energy of the molecule tends to disrupt the structure of the enzyme. We lose the active sites. It's a process called denaturation. And so when you consider that all of the metabolic activity that occurs within a lizard or within a mouse or within a human or within a plant, all of that metabolic activity is the result of teams and teams of enzymes that are working together to create this autocatalytic physiology of cells and their organisms. It should strike you as somewhat obvious as to why higher temperatures should be better, relatively speaking, to lower temperatures. You're more able to process foods at rapid rates. In the case of an animal, your ability to respond to environmental stimuli, to run away from predators, to track prey items, all of those things related to behavioral performance, uh, probably related to fitness, are also directly impacted by the body temperature of the organism. Okay? Being Warmer means you're a little bit faster, a little bit smarter than the cooler organism, and that's going to be associated with a selective advantage. Now, in the case of this little lizard, we're seeing a homeothermy that is achieved behaviorally as opposed to physiologically, which is the case with things like mammals and birds. Um, we don't have any internal mechanism for elevating body temperature. The lizard actually has to come out and physically sit in a warm spot in order to get warm. Mammals and birds, including you, are able to do this from within. And so I guess the question now is, well, what is the internal mechanism by which physiological endotherms are able to elevate their body temperature? Where is your furnace? Now, when I ask this question in my regular classes, I'll typically get a lot of wrong answers, like, like the heart. You know, some, you know, some people think that inside your heart, there's some type of heater like structure and that's generating the heat. Now the answer here is your skeletal muscle. The same muscles that you use to move around are also your heat generating organs. Okay. Now skeletal muscles operate on the basis of opposing musculature, antagonistic muscles. So in the case of your forelimb, you've got two opposing muscles you're probably familiar with. Um, you've got a biceps muscle, which when contracted will cause your arm to flex. And you've got on the opposite side, on the back side of your arm, you've got a triceps muscle, which when contracted will cause your arm to straighten. We call that extension. So basically the mechanical work of your flexing and extending your arm is due to the expenditure of energy in your biceps to cause flexion, or by extending ATP energy in your triceps, you'll re uh, the result will be uh, extension of your arm. Now what happens when you expend energy both in the triceps and the biceps, what happens when you attempt to contract both of them at the same time? Well, within each muscle, we've got these fibers. And within each muscle fiber, we've got the molecular mechanism that underlies the mechanical work, the transduction of chemical work into mechanical work. And that begins with hydrolysis of ATP into adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. Now the energy change here, the, the energy released, some, some of you uh, might be familiar with the concept of Gibbs free energy. would say that Gibbs free energy here is going to be less than zero, or in other words, we'll have energy released because the energy potential of adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate is lower compared to ATP and water. And this energy released is going to be manifest in two forms. Uh, first of all, we'll get the mechanical work which in the case of the biceps muscle would be the flexion of your arm. In the case of the triceps, it would be extension, but basically moving your skeletal muscle around, that's mechanical work, and it's driven by ATP energy, and this is how it's achieved. Okay. The other thing that's going to happen is we'll be producing heat. And the reason why heat is going to be produced is because of the second law of thermodynamics. In any kind of reaction, whether it's a chemical reaction or a reaction where we're moving energy from a chemical form into mechanical form, there's got to be an increase in the disorder or entropy of the system. And heat, as it turns out, is a very high entropy or disorderly form of energy. Okay, so production of heat is basically allowing us to satisfy the natural laws of the universe, and that's just the way it is. Okay? Now getting back to this question of what happens when both biceps and triceps are expending energy, well, we're not able to achieve mechanical work. Mechanical work is basically shut off. 
And so if we're not moving our skeleton around, in other words, if there's no mechanical work, uh, we still have to account for all of the energy being released from the ATP. The energy being released is the same, and if it can't go down path A, it's got to go down path B, and so we're going to have an increase in the total production of heat. Heat production is going to go up. Now you can do this as you're sitting in your chair right now. You could tense the muscles in your upper arm. Get, you know, those muscles get a lot harder. Uh, your arm doesn't move, and you're also producing heat. Now you don't have to do this consciously in order to elevate your body temperature. In order to maintain your body temperature, you've got this part of your brain called the hypothalamus, and it automatically adjusts the tenseness or the tone of your muscles to generate just the right amount of heat to maintain your body temperature at a set point of about 37.4 degrees Celsius. Okay? When your blood temperature drops even a little bit, your hypothalamus detects that lower body temperature and it adjusts. It basically makes your muscle tone go up a little bit, causing your skeletal muscle to elevate your body temperature. Now when the hypothalamus detects a little bit of an elevation of body temperature, it accommodates that by reducing the muscle tone. Okay? So you actually become a little bit softer when your body temperature is warmer. Now this is totally related to a phenomenon that you're probably familiar with called shivering. Okay? Now in the case of shivering, your blood temperatures drop so much that your hypothalamus attempts to cause your muscles to tense up, operating antagonistically, causing the production of heat to increase to elevate your body temperature, but at a certain point it no longer becomes controlled. And that uncontrolled spasmodic tensing of the muscles is what you, is what you experience as shivering. Now in the case of mammals, we've got a second mechanism of heat production, or non-shivering thermogenesis, which is possible as a result of certain kinds of fat tissue. Um, it's brown in color. Sometimes we call it brown fat. Now the dark color of brown fat, as opposed to your typical yellow, creamy colored fat, is the result of respiratory pigments like myoglobin. And we'll be talking about that pretty soon. But the basic mechanism of brown fat involves special mitochondria. You might want to remind yourselves of what mitochondria look like. I'll draw a picture of one here. Okay, so that's pretty good mitochondria, and you've got an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And the way that mitochondria work uh, to generate lots of ATP energy, you might have to remember back to your lessons in oxidative phosphorylation, but the general idea is that we've got this electron transport system, and the electron transport system is continually pushing, pushing, pushing these ions, hydrogen ions, hydrogen ions are being pushed into the intermembrane space, out of the inner matrix, into the intermembrane space. And hydrogen ions have positive charges, and so the outcome of all this activity of the electron transport chain is a lot of positive charges in the space in between the two membranes. Comparatively speaking, the inside of the mitochondria, the inner matrix, is going to have a negative charge. It's going to be a pretty strong voltage gradient. Having taken all the positive charges out of the inner matrix, we get what amounts to be basically an organic battery. We've got all of these positively charged hydrogen, actually hydronium ions, on one side of the membrane, a negative charge on the other side. So there's a really strong force. We call it a proton motive force. And we take advantage of that. Uh, we, we associate the movement, the, the permission of hydrogen ions back into the inner matrix from the intermembrane space. Two of these protons are allowed back in, we go, they go through an ATP synthase, and uh, the result is the production of ATP. We're coupling ATP production with the movement of these hydrogen ions back into the inner matrix from the intermembrane space. This is going to be associated with ATP production. ATP produced here. Okay. I'll make another copy of this mitochondrion over here. And so this mitochondrion is going to be that of a brown fat cell. And, uh, and in contrast to your typical mitochondrion, the inner membrane, that membrane separating the positive charged intermembrane space and the inner matrix, is actually going to be porous. It's going to be porous, allowing these hydrogen ions to flow back in. Uh, and they're flowing back in for free, which is which, which they're more than happy to do, right? There's a, uh, there's a really strong force. In other words, as a result of having all of these uh, protons moving in, we're going to be cutting off the production of ATP. Uh, ATP production is going to be dramatically reduced as a result of this leaky inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And so we're basically going through all the steps of ATP production, except with the production of ATP. We're, we're, we're consuming food molecules and lots of oxygen. That's where the respiratory pigments come in. Or we, need to, we need to take in lots of oxygen. 
And like with a normal mitochondrion, we're using the oxidation potential of food, converting it to a waste molecule at a higher oxidation state, to generate ATP energy, the, uh, the Gibbs free energy, the energy released here. In this case, it's being associated with the conversion of ADP and phosphate into ATP. That's oxidative phosphorylation, at least the part in the mitochondrion. That part is being blocked off. We're not generating ATP in the same degree that we did before. Uh, remember that we need to account for all the energy. All the energy that's released with the conversion of food into waste has got to be accounted for. And if we're not going to be producing ATP, then there's only one place for this to go, and that's going to be with the production of heat. Right. And so by loading up uh, these cells, these fat cells with mitochondria that don't produce very much ATP but do produce heat, and also loading them up with respiratory pigments that allow them to take in oxygen at a pretty fast rate, we're able to generate quite a bit of heat. This is something that we typically find in juveniles and babies. Babies have lots of brown fat. Uh, that kind of makes sense for the babies of mammals to have brown fat because these are the individuals that are most vulnerable to heat loss. They don't have a huge amount of fat, insulating fat, or body covering, and they're also not really limited calorically. They're, they're nursing, so they have a pretty steady inflow of calories, and so having this extra heater can definitely be understood as being a really good thing for these mammals. Okay. So I want you to remember that there's, uh, there are two sides to the relationship between body temperature and metabolic rate. Uh, certainly, uh, so far we've been talking about how metabolic activity is able to generate heat, and that's important for elevating body temperature. But you've you got, you got to come back to this general idea that it's the temperature of the enzymes, it's the temperature of the cells that kind of dictates how metabolically active an organism can be. So if you look at this graph, if you look at this graph, which is uh, thoracic temperature of honeybees versus metabolic rate, what we do is we hook up honeybees to uh, thermocouples. We can measure their body temperature by planting a little thermocouple inside of their thorax. Okay? And we can measure how much oxygen that they're consuming. That's kind of like our metric for how, uh, how high or how low the metabolic rate is. And we see this uh, increasing pattern. We see, we, we see that J-shaped curve, which as you might remember is also characteristic of the increasing curve that we see on the left-hand side of enzymatic activity graphs. And so the pattern in this graph shouldn't be surprising at all to you. Uh, as body temperature increases, we're seeing those enzymes encounter their substrates at a faster and faster rate, and so they're able to convert food molecules into calories, and that's going to result in a greater and greater consumption of oxygen. Consumption of oxygen, by the way, is probably the easiest way for us to monitor the overall metabolic activity of an animal. Okay? If we were to see increases beyond 38 to 40 degrees, we would probably see that other side, the, uh, the decline occurring as a result of uh, denaturation of the enzymes. But this is a humane experiment. We don't really need to show that if you overheat a honeybee, it starts to die. Okay. Now the next graph should be a little bit of a surprise to you. It, it'll be the same coordinates. Basically we'll be having, we'll be having metabolic rate on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. In this case we've got willow ptarmigans and we're putting them into boxes and we're measuring the temperature, the ambient temperature inside the box and we're measuring their consumption of oxygen. The metabolic rate on the y-axis is probably being estimated by the consumption of oxygen. Uh, here though, we're seeing exactly the opposite relationship. As the temperature of the box increases, the oxygen consumption is dropping, going from a box temperature of minus 40 up, up higher, 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 up to like uh, 30 degrees Celsius. We're seeing the metabolic rate of summer ptarmigans uh, decreasing. Uh, with winter ptarmigans, we can go from a box at minus 70 degrees Celsius all the way up to 20 or 30 degrees Celsius, and we're seeing a similar decrease in, uh, in calorie consumption and oxygen consumption. And why is this? Okay. I think the answer should be relatively transparent to you, and it has everything to do with uh, the fact that ptarmigans are, are birds. And uh, being birds, they maintain a constant body temperature, even though the temperature of the box they're put in gets really, really cold. Okay, so the internal body temperature of the ptarmigan, if you, if you were to measure the body temperature of the ptarmigan, uh, it would be the same uh, for all these living birds. You know, if the bird were to actually freeze to death, then its body temperature would actually decline. But all these lively, actively homeothermic ptarmigans, and what we're seeing here is an increase in calorie consumption as necessary to to maintain that steady body temperature in the colder boxes. Okay, you got that? Physiological endotherm, ectothermic B, right? 
The difference here is that these colder bees are not expending a lot of calories to keep their body temperature elevated. They're just cold, right? And because they're cold, they're not consuming that many calories. These colder ptarmigans, on the other hand, uh, are expending tons of calories. They're having to throw lots of logs into the fire. They have to maintain a high caloric consumption in order to keep their body temperatures constant. Now this comes at substantial energetic costs. Obviously, it, um, these birds are throwing lots of calories simply towards the maintenance of body temperature. And those calories have got to come from someplace. These birds, under colder temperatures, they've got to eat. They've got to consume lots of food in order to do this, right? Um, but now I want to give you an example of an endotherm that doesn't necessarily need to go through that same degree of energetic expenditure in order to maintain its elevated body temperature. And I'm thinking about those fishes that are able to maintain body temperatures substantially higher than the water that they're swimming through. Uh, one great example of this is a tuna, an ultra tuna over here, uh, just to show you what the general body plan of a tuna is as opposed to a different kind of fish. Okay, so uh, the body shape of a tuna is really kind of torpedo shaped. It's rounded in profile. When you go back to the tail, you've got a really narrow caudal peduncle, and the tail is really sickle shaped. You know, this caudal peduncle area has got a really cylindrical profile. It's almost round in cross section. Now, when you contrast this with a trout or any typical fish, what we often have is more laterally flattened. In other words, in profile, it's not quite so, so round. It's a little bit more narrow. And the caudal peduncle tends to also be kind of tall and thin, laterally flattened, and the tail tends to be kind of fan-shaped. Um, this area in the middle called the caudal peduncle, okay, this area right here, on the fish, this is really different when we compare a tuna versus a trout. Uh, the other difference is the tail. The tails, or the caudal fin, is very different between a tuna and a trout. And, and, and the outcome of this is that these fishes are swimming using different strokes. Okay? In the case of a trout, if we, if we look at it from the top, the trout swimming occurs as a result of kind of like a flexion of the body. The whole body basically sw swings back and forth. In this case, so the, the body might swing like that, and would swing over here, and you would get this uh, movement of water. Water gets pushed back as the body of the trout moves back and forth. Okay? In the case of the tuna, it's a little bit different. It's kind of the same, but it's really kind of different. When we think about that tuna fish with its round shape, that round profile, kind of a torpedo shape, and that really narrow caudal peduncle and the stiff tail, its swimming is going to be uh, it's going to be different. It's going to have more rapid tail strokes. The tail is going to be moving back and forth at a much more rapid rate, and uh, and the outcome of this is that we have far less turbulence. Okay? The uh, the advantage of tunas, the way they swim, we call this thuniform swimming. The advantage of this type of swimming is that we create far less turbulence wake. If you look at the water that's behind the tuna as it swims through the water, it's, it's, it's not agitated at all. In contrast, your typical fish, which has got this uh, sub caranchiform style of swimming, compared to the thuniform swimmer, it leaves behind quite a large amount of turbulence wake. Right? Now, the size of the turbulence wake represents energy that the fish has expended. Okay. The swimming of the fish does two things. It moves the fish forward, and it also creates a little bit of turbulence behind it. Now, by moving through the water with very little turbulence wake behind it, the tuna is actually a far more efficient swimmer. Okay. Uh, this thunderform swimming using this narrow caudal peduncle, a stiff sickle-shaped tail, that's the classic description of thunderform swimmers, they're moving through the water and basically leaving the water perfectly still behind them. It's great if you're in open water and you never need to, to stop and back up. But in most situations, in, more, in, in situations where you do have those other types of swimming challenges apart from simply swimming forward, uh, sub form swimming is actually probably a better choice. Okay? Uh, that's why we find sub form swimmers inshore and those animals, those, those fishes that use thunderform swimmers like tuna and laminate sharks, including the great white shark, uh, they tend to be completely open water fish. They, you, know, you never see a great white shark backing up to take a look at you. Right? You would have to swim a big circle, turn around, and then come back and attack. Now, so what does all this talk about um, fish swimming have to deal with maintaining a body temperature that's elevated? Well, as you know, most fishes, like trout, are ectothermic. So if we look at most kinds of fishes, most kinds of fishes that use sub form swimmers, they're going to be entirely ectothermic. Their body temperature will be pretty much exactly the same as the water around them. 
Um, and that's because the muscles that they use for swimmer, swimming, especially those muscles that are continually used for swimming, are the only opportunity that a fish would ever have to elevate its body temperature by means of using skeletal muscle would be when it's swimming, by using its, mus its body musculature, which is mostly there for swimming. Now the dark muscle, which is richly myoglobinated, it's pulling on the oxygen very effectively. Uh, most, in most times, most of these subcarangiform swimmers, the dark muscle is located along the outer flanks of the fish's musculature. So if we were to contract that muscle, if we were to contract this muscle right here, contracting this muscle here, it would cause the left side of the fish to shorten, the, the fish's uh, body would curve uh, over to the left, and, uh, and that's what and that's what would push the water backwards, and that's how you generate subcarangiform swimming. Right? Now, in the case of a thunniform swimmer, the, uh, the body musculature, the, what, the, the muscles that are required to move the tail and the caudal pedicle back and forth very rapidly, they don't occur along the outside. They occur closer to the center line of the fish. Okay, so you've got a, a muscle over here, another muscle on the other side. And these are the muscles doing the pulling on the caudal pedicle, causing the uh, tail to, to swing back and forth with these really rapid tail beats. They're located in the interior of the fish, which basically presents the thunderform swimmer with a new opportunity. Now, one of the key things to keep in mind here is that water is an extremely good conductor of heat. Uh, one reason why a subcarangiform swimmer can never use its body musculature to elevate its body temperature is because all of this hot muscle. I mean, even though the muscle might heat up right there on the surface, it's, it's in contact with cold water. And so heat is rapidly lost to the outside world. I mean, there's no opportunity for any kind of subcarangiform swimmer to uh, keep any of that heat because it's going to be primarily lost to the outside world. In the case of a tuna, on the other hand, uh, simply swimming through its world is going to cause a lot of body heat to be generated internally. And so simply by virtue of swimming around in its world, a tuna is going to have an elevated body temperature in compared to all of its non-tuna neighbors. Uh, and that includes all of its prey items, you know, any sardine or sari or any kind of bait fish or squid that's swimming around is going to be moving around in slow motion. You know, if you think about it, it's a great idea. It's, this, is, this is a huge advantage to the tuna. Not only are they able to move through their watery world with great efficiency because of their thunderform swimming and little turbulence wake, they're also elevating their body temperature, and this allows them to be smarter, faster, stronger than uh, the other animals around them that are operating at lower body temperature. Okay? And they, and they really need to be doing this. They need to be generating this heat anyways. You know, after all, fish have to swim, right? And while this heat generation might not necessarily be happening for free, it is different from the situation that we have with mammals and birds, where we have to throw a considerable amount of our energetic budget simply towards the maintenance of elevated body temperature.